Do you have questions about your DHEA levels? Are you wondering how do I lower DHEA levels? My name is Dr. Taranella, and in this video, we're going to be going into more detail on things that can be done to lower your DHEA levels when they are high. In the last video, we talked about the impact of cortisol and stress, and in this video, we're going to be looking at the enzyme 3 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase and some of the things that influence the functioning of this enzyme and what you can do to get it to work better to lower your DHEA levels. So if you're liking these videos, click on the like button and subscribe to the channel to get more videos like it. If you'd like to make a financial contribution to keep the channel going and support the channel, there's a link in the description to a uh, PayPal link where you can make a donation. Any amount's appreciated. All right, let's look at how to lower DHEA levels. So in this video, we will once again look at how do I lower DHEA levels. In the last video on this topic, we looked at how to lower DHEA levels through lowering cortisol and stress. And here we will, we will look at the enzyme responsible for breaking down DHEA sulfate and why it may not be working properly or, or how it can be sped up and uh, work more efficiently. Before we jump into that, though, I just want to give a quick reminder that the approach to lowering DHEA levels will depend on your particular system and the reason it is high to begin with. The body is a complex system with multiple layers of feedback inhibition. Understanding your particular system takes a lot of patience and diligence and testing and also you need help uh, from someone with clinical experience in most cases. That would mean, you know, some medical professional. Keep all that in mind when we're going through these different systems because there may be pieces of, pieces of it that aren't included in this video or that just aren't included at all because it's just too complex. So also keep in mind in these videos we're referring to DHEA sulfate. I may say DHEA, but it's DHEA sulfate. When referring to elevated levels, that's really what we want to be testing, not plain DHEA. So with that in mind, let's look at how the enzyme 3-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase can lower DHEA levels. 3-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase is responsible for creating a lot of different hormones. With regard to DHEA sulfate, it converts DHEA sulfate into androstenedione. dione. It can also make a lot of other hormones, like it can turn pregnenolone into progesterone, it can convert androstenedione dione into testosterone, and there's many other things that this enzyme does. This enzyme, like many enzymes, requires a cofactor for it to work properly and efficiently. And cofactors are basically like things that encourage reactions to occur. So similar to lighting a fire, uh, you can light a fire a lot of different ways, but if you have some sort of helper or accelerant like gasoline, it's gonna light a lot easier and a lot quicker. NAD is the cofactor for 3 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase. Oftentimes people with metabolic disorders like diabetes, prediabetes, or just simple insulin resistance without the other two will have lower NAD levels. It's a kind of a hallmark of uh, insulin resistance. So if this is you, then you know what you can work on, at least in part, to lower your DHEA levels. There's going to be less NAD present and less cofactor present. Therefore, less of your DHEA is going to be converted into androstenedione and the downstream metabolites. So what do you do about this? Well, you can focus on improving your blood sugar for one, but remember, even if you know, you've know you had your blood levels checked or you don't think you have the insulin resistance, there are different ways that insulin resistance can present and different ways to check for this. So just because you don't have a fasting blood sugar that's elevated or a hemoglobin A1C that's elevated does not mean you don't have insulin resistance. There's different ways to check for it, uh, meaning different testing, and there's also different phenotypes, ways that the body will present this on lab tests. If you've done the basic testing, like fasting insulin and hemoglobin A1C, you probably want to go a little bit deeper just to double check and be sure that none of this is going on, especially if you have symptoms, you know, like overweight or fatty liver, things like that would suggest, you know, that you do have this, this issue with insulin resistance and possibly uh, lower NAD levels. So you can do things like two hours postprandial, you can check the HDL, the triglyceride ratio, fasting insulin, etc. All these are different ways to look for insulin resistance and it's a spectrum of disease progression with diabetes, uh, severe diabetes being over here and mild insulin resistance being over here. And as that insulin resistance gets worse, you see you need more and more interventions to keep the blood sugar under control and 
many other things too, like triglycerides and, and other health-related things. The classic scenario you'll see is high insulin, high blood sugar, high A1C, high triglycerides. But it doesn't always present that way. Sometimes you can have normal triglycerides, like under 100, but you still have high insulin. So there's different ways the body can present with this, and there's, there's different reasons for that. So again, some cases may be very apparent, other cases may not be, so you have to look at it from different angles. Overall, though, the main thing to do about this is to get better blood sugar control, lower your insulin, and create more metabolic flexibility. Doing things like fasting and lowering your carbohydrate intake will likely improve your overall NAD to NADH ratio. Now, sometimes people will say, well, maybe I'll just take an NAD supplement. There are some, There is some evidence suggesting that may work. Um, I think if your overall metabolism is not where it should be, uh, it's not really going to help. It's like a drop in the bucket, you know, a big sea of niacin molecules floating around, and you know, you're just putting a little bit in, and it, the body's going to convert it into what it needs. So, you know, planning on supplementing with NAD, you should also make sure your overall metabolism is where it should be to get the most benefit out of that. Another thing to keep in mind is that many of the constituents in soy products can also decrease the activity of 3-beta-hydroxy steroid dehydrogenase. These are collectively referred to as soy isoflavones or phytoestrogens. And enzyme function studies show that many of these isoflavones, like genistein, do decrease this enzyme activity. The more of it that's in your diet, the more likely it's going to lower the enzyme activity. These studies weren't actually done in live human subjects. It was enzyme function studies, so they're more like test tube studies. Still, it's something to consider, especially if you're on a plant-based diet where you're eating a lot of soy products like tofu and tempeh and things like this. Again, there are many layers of feedback inhibition to promote this enzyme to work the way it should, and also things that will inhibit it. So you have to take all the information uh, in consideration, including the information on the other, other video about cortisol and stress, and put it together with your symptoms and your lab values to create the overall clinical picture. And it is best that you do this in conjunction with a doctor that can uh, ask the right questions and, and look at this from the different angles that are going to help you understand why your DHEA levels are elevated to begin with, and then proceed with the right treatment plan to lower those DHEA levels. Okay, that's all I had for this video on how do I lower DHEA levels. Hopefully that gives you a better understanding of what could be going on with your body when you have high DHEA levels. This was part two in a probably four part series on how to lower DHEA levels. Next time we'll be looking at some of the feedback inhibition and what you can do about that. And then we'll also be going into more depth on different ways of testing to understand how all this fits together. If you like the video, please click on the like button and subscribe to the channel to get more like it. Thank you again for watching. We'll see you next time.